like you to open the book of John chapter 8. That's where we are speaking the word. And then we'll have our announcements later as we continue. Did you carry your Bible? Say, this is my Bible. Come on, lift it up. Let's see that you're telling the truth. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. I submit myself to its authority and it is counsel. Today, my mind is alert. My heart is open. My spirit is willing to receive a deposit that shall cause an eternal impact in my life and in the lives of those around me. In Jesus' name. You see why you can't lift your phone? Right, right. John 8 verse 1. Read with me, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him. Mm -hmm. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your gift. Speak to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in one way or the other, you must have interacted with this text. If you have not... If you have not read it, then it means that uh, you have heard it from somewhere, either somebody telling the story, or you have heard it taught, uh, because this is a very popular uh, passage of scripture. The adulterous woman, or the woman caught in adultery, is a very common story. You might have heard it in nursery school, or in those who are... Uh, diligent in the denomination where you are, uh, maybe singing the Ten Commandments, the catechism. How many people here did catechism? Yeah? There's one God, you know, you know, it becomes a song. Sing with your mind, but your heart is dead, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but we remember in primary school, we used to sing this, you could hear this when you're going through your CRE lesson. It's a common story. It's not like... Uh, the, some stories of Mephibosheth or something. That is a very hard story. But this one is common. And we've heard about it. Now, for you to get the context of this word, you'll notice that the scriptures are not divided into chapters and verses. This was divided because of our understanding. Because it's easy for you to quote uh, chapter 8, verse 1, for our, our understanding, but the scroll was a continuous prose, meaning it was one, one letter. So you could not tell where chapter ends or starts. 
but you notice that this story does not begin at chapter 8 because it's a continuation of chapter 7. The Bible declares that after Jesus has taught, everybody went to their house. But Jesus, as it was his custom, did not go to his house. He went to the Mount of Olives to pray. Uh, that is why Jesus had the confidence always to say that I do that not which is of my own, but I only do that which I see my father do. You can only have that confidence if you tarry, if you spend time with someone. Because if you spend time with someone, you do not only know what he does, but why he does the things he does. That is why Psalms chapter 1 or 3 verse 7 says that he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Meaning that Moses knew his ways. Moses knew why he was doing what he was doing. But the children of Israel only knew the acts. They were only seeing the, the doings of God. But they were not seeing the heart of God. Moses knew that because Moses was a friend of God. And Moses spent time with God. Because sometimes when you spend time with God or with a friend, you get to know things that other people do not know. Is that true? And sometimes uh, other people might mistake your friend because of what he has done, but because you have spent time with him, you will know that he didn't mean what he did. True? But those who are close to a friend would know that that was out of mistake or it was an accident. But those who have not spent time with him, they only know his doings, his behavior. They judge according to behavior, but you judge according to the heart. Uh, that is why Jesus spent a lot of time when people went to their homes to spend time with themselves. Uh, Jesus went or retired to a mountain somewhere so that he can uh, spend some time with God. Uh, he has also said sometimes that the foxes have holes. You remember that story? The foxes have holes mm? and the birds have. But the son of man, he has no where to lay his head. But we find that where he laid his head, where Jesus found rest was in God's presence. That is why when disciples were trying to get food or meat out of the city of Samaria, they came back and they were asking, did you have some food? He says, no, I have meat that you know not of because my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So he, the, the meat, he felt most satisfied in God's presence and in doing his will. So they retired, he retired to a place of uh, prayer. But after that, the Bible says in the morning, he came down the mountain and went to the temple to teach because most of the things uh, he taught. Have you ever asked yourself why teaching is very important? The Bible declares that Jesus saw the multitudes and they looked like sheep without a shepherd and he sat them down and taught them. You'd ask if people are needy and in want, you'd think they need motivation. They need encouragement. They need a preacher. But most of the time, Jesus sat and taught them because it is in teaching that your eyes are opened. It is in teaching that you receive revelation. So he sat and taught them. And people loved this teaching because they said, what manner of man is this? A man that teaches with authority and not with, like some of our scribes or some of our Pharisees. Now, Jesus has descended from the mountain and he's teaching in the temple. Uh, you'd notice that in the temple or sometimes when scripture refers to the synagogue, it's not just a building, but it's a people. If 12 or more people gather together, it was uh, a church to them. And therefore, that building that housed that team was called a synagogue. A synagogue was a place of teaching. So these people gathered in the temple to be taught of Jesus. 
Now, I want you to imagine because one very critical key in understanding scripture is number one, what we call observation, because you have to do observation before you do interpretation and before you do application. If you read scripture and apply it immediately, you're going to lose the heart or the spirit of the verse. Most of us, when you read the Bible, we go to application immediately. Uh, we ask something like this. Uh, have you guys read? Yes. What does it mean to you? Because you already, or how is it relevant to me today? You've already gone to application before you under, even understand what is happening. Are you getting me? So, for you to understand what Jesus is talking about, you must observe. And in observation, you ask yourself, who are the people involved here? Where is the setting? What is happening? Because sometimes you understand the significance of a verse or a passage if you understand the emotions that are encompassing that passage. Now imagine with me that Jesus is seated at the temple and there are multitudes like you're sitting today. And while he's teaching, in the course of his teaching, his service is interrupted. When people are quiet like you are uh, this morning, his service is abruptly interrupted and there is a commotion at the, at the door and the, when there is a commotion at the door there are scribes and, Pharis, uh, and Pharisees are dragging someone some lady are being, is being dragged into the service and while everybody is looking the Bible says and they drag the woman into the temple and put her in the midst of the congregation meaning that in this place they would drag her and place her here so that everybody can see. Even if you are emotionally removed or distant, you must accept or recognize the emotional torture that this lady is going through. True? That this lady, there is no torture, there is no shame that she can ever go through like this kind of shame. Because she's been dragged. Now let's look at the people that, uh, that, that are bringing this lady into the service. The first one is the scribes. And who are the scribes? The scribes are the lawyers, the people who are conversant or professionals in the matters of the law. These were people who were learned. These were people who were conversant. These were people who knew the law inside out. And you'll find when you're reading scripture, throughout scripture, you're going to find the interaction or confrontation of Jesus with the scribes because they are always bringing in the matters of the law. He says, our fathers say this. Moses, they say this. What do you say? So they are confronting Jesus with the issues of the law. And these are now the people that are bringing now, fighting with one lawyer is hard enough. What about if their lawyers are concerted and united in accusing you? The woman had no advocate at all. The woman had nobody to stand with her at all. Because in the situation where she was, nobody wanted to associate with her. Remember, they said, the, we caught this woman in adultery. We are not suspecting we have not heard about it. It has not been WhatsApp or SMS to us. We saw it. Hmm? We saw it. And the command of the law said what? <laughs> he said, thou shall not commit adultery. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14 says, thou shall not commit adultery. It was very clear. But what they missed, the lawyers, they missed because in the provisions of the law or the demands of the law, every act of adultery is not a solo act. True? Come on, don't behave like you don't know. Come on, church people, sometimes you amaze me, right? The, we are, every act of, do you know what adultery is? Adultery has more than one person, right? So if it is true that your thinking is correct as mine, and we believe that these were two people, that means there was a man involved, isn't it? Adultery means one or both of them was married. True? Either both of them was, were married, or this woman was sleeping with a married husband, or she was married, but the, the, the one she was sleeping with was not. I know, I know it's getting uncomfortable, but just follow me, right? <laughs> I know it's getting <laughs> uncomfortable, but just walk with me. Do you promise to try? 
because it's important to my preaching. If I left this out, I might miss my point, right? So one of them or both of them were married. The law, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Let's read Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. What does it say? Read with me. It says, the man who commits with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, that, and the adulteress. Are you seeing that the law demanded that when you bring an accusation about adultery, you should bring the man and you should bring the woman. The man in this case is called the Ada. Huh? And the woman is called the? Yeah. I just think those nice titles. The adulteress. <laughs> the adulteress is the woman. Now, for a very interesting reason, the scribes and the Pharisees did not think about bringing the man. If it was in the act, meaning they found both of them together, but they picked the lady. But scripture tells us in verse 6 of John 8 why they left the lady. Because these people were not even concerned about the lady or what she had done. There is a reason why the scribes and the Pharisees brought the lady. Why would they choose to embarrass this woman? Why would they choose to bring her before a, the public and a multitude of people? Why would these people conspire and unite together just to embarrass and to crush the spirit of this woman? John chapter 8 verse 6, what does it say? John chapter 8 verse 6, the, the scriptures we read gives us the reason why. What, what does it say? Verse 6 says, this they said... Ah, so it means that these people went to all this tri trouble, not even thinking about the heart of this woman, just to prove a point. Just to be right. Can you imagine? That they just wanted to test Jesus. So in all this, the woman was just a victim, isn't it? The woman was just a victim because she was not the object of this discussion. Uh-uh. They wanted to test Jesus, and several in Scripture, they have tried. They have tried to, to test Jesus. So what happens? Uh, he steps, stoops down and writes. But they continue pestering him because when he stoops down to write, uh, he's, like he, he's not concerned. He's not like listening to what they are saying. They are saying, can't you listen to what we are telling you? But he's still writing. And when he continues to write, they continue to ask the question and he stands up and says, no problem. I now give you permission to stone her. Only that I want the first person. It's called the principle of first witness. I want the first witness. He that is without sin, let him the f be the first one to cast the stone. Because he was using the principle from the book of Deuteronomy. If we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 13, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 9, what does it say? Deuteronomy 13, verse 9. Deuteronomy 13, what does it say? And afterward, the hand of all the people, your hand, the first witness, your hand shall be the first one to do what? Because they must be the first one. People are very good at hiding in multitudes. People are very good in hiding in crowds. But you'll also find there are so many people when they accuse you, they are not, they are cowards. They do not have the courage to face you. But in a crowd, it's very easy. Because <laughs> when you are stoning the police, there is some sense of security in doing that evil. But when you are located alone, he says, so, sir, what were you saying? <laughs> eh? Have you heard in a classroom when somebody is speaking to a group of students and people are murmuring and doing what, and you just pick one of them? You say, so, sir, what, what, what were you saying? 
Because there's a principle of first witness. He says, now you shall be the first one to cast the stone. If somebody has been convicted or judged to, de judged to deserve to be stoned to death. Remember, the stoning of death was outside the camp. Anybody who was judged to be fit for stoning was taken outside the camp. And then the witnesses, if you read Acts, when we, they were stoning Stephen, for example, they took him out of the camp and they were stoning. They were witnesses. But there's a first witness that says, this man is guilty and I agree, before others come and stone. Deuteronomy 16 also, 16 verse 6 and 7. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 16 verse, let's do 17. Deuteronomy 17. Yeah, 17. This is about roasting, but I want 17.6. 17.6, what does it say? 17.6, 6 and 7. 6, read with me, it says. Three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one. Number 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. And afterwards, So are you seeing? The hand of the witnesses shall be the first. So I say, I witnessed. Hmm? I witnessed the act. So I want to judge him first before the others can come in. He was still writing. When he was still writing, so he stood and said, okay, anyone who is the first, start stoning him. And he stooped down and continued to write. Sometimes when you read scripture, you'll find some, some, some acts that are weird. Uh, one of, this is, one of, of it is this one. Have you ever wondered what he was writing? Mm? Because maybe you, you just read through. There are some very funny things when you read scripture. And you have to pause and to think about. Because when he told them that, he just took down and continued writing. But there's something that is important that happened. The Bible says, but they didn't continue agitating and screaming, crucify him, or kill him, or kill her. No. The Bible says they were convicted in their heart, isn't it? Their conscience. All of a sudden, their conscience, meaning what Jesus had done, had an effect on their conscience. Had something about their conscience. There's something that was touched about their conscience. It's also very interesting to note that when they started going out, they didn't go out as a crowd. They started from the eldest. Have you ever noticed those things in scripture? They started from the eldest. Hmm? Then those who had it being convicted by the conscience went out one. They came in as a crowd. Hmm? They came in as a... But they left... Because when Jesus wrote down, right then, it, did not, it was not a crowd affair. Somebody was just meditating on himself saying, eh, huh? Eh? It was not a crowd affair. They left one by one until the woman remained standing. I could also imagine that this lady was not upstanding. She was not like raising her face because when you are going through something like that, uh -uh, your face is not up. Maybe she was cold in herself, wondering. If, when this woman, I told you about the scribes, but I also need to tell you about the Pharisees because the Pharisees were not experts in the law, but the Pharisees were experts in tradition. They kept the traditions. He says, every time you read scripture, you're going to find them saying, we keep the traditions of our fathers. We keep the traditions of our fathers. Uh, how comes that your disciples are, no, are not washing their hands? How comes that, you know, according to the tradition, and Jesus said, uh, rebuke them and told them that you make the word of God of none effect or no effect because of your traditions. He also told them that there are some of you that are teaching for doctrines the traditions of men. Uh, there are people who are teaching today what look like the gospel, but are just the principles of men. Because only the word of God has spirit and has life. But if you are taught the thinking and the motivations of men, 
it can illuminate your intelligence or in your intellect, but your heart does not move because it lacks the spirit. So these people were kept in tradition. They were just asking do's and don'ts. But you'll find the essence of religion is tradition and its rules and regulation. And most of us have just embraced the rules and regulation. Do this, don't do this. Touch this. Uh, you see, Christianity is not a religion of do's and don'ts. Christianity is a lifestyle of knowing someone, isn't it? It's a relationship that I come to the place of freedom when I know someone, not when I do things. Because we are human beings, we become or we become before we do. We are not human doings. You are not judged by what you do. Uh -uh. You are judged by who you are, isn't it? When he came before God and they, they were asking, he has done this. Jesus was not looking at what he did or what she did. No, Jesus was looking at who she is. And she was a sinner in need of a savior. Jesus looked at her as a recipient of mercy. Jesus looked at her as a candidate to extend mercy. He was not looking at somebody to punish. Some people have said uh, the church is the only place where they murder their soldiers. When you look around and see your soldier has been failed in a battlefront, you, you come and check. How are you doing? If you find mkono bado inafanya hivi, unamalizia. Iyo imebaki. Because, look, these scribe and Pharisees, you'd think that people go to the temple to receive mercy. They took this adulterous woman to the temple for accusation. Just to prove a point. Just to prove that they were correct. Because they wanted to hold Jesus onto something. Why was this question difficult? You know, when we read on the surface, we might think it was very simple. But it was a very difficult question. Because imagine if Jesus responded and said, I have forgiven her, please do not do that. They would accuse Jesus of breaking the law. Yet Jesus had said that I have not come to break the law, I have come to fulfill the law. So that means he could not, he could not say I have forgiven her. Neither did she, did, could Jesus say stone, stone her because at that time it was only the Romans that were legally ar allowed to carry out judgment. So they wanted to accuse him to Caesar because he said he has broken your law. So either yes or no, he would break the law. He would break the law of God or break the law of the land. Hmm? The Bible tells us that when God gave the commandments, what we have read in Exodus, if you read the book of Exodus 20, talks about the commandments. Do not do this, do not do this. It was written on tablets, isn't it? Not the first one, but the second one. Because the, the first one, the, the members of the church <laughs> really annoyed the pastor, isn't it? By the time he came down from his um, intercessory room, he found the people doing funny, funny things. He said, Pow! this denomination will break you. Everybody go home. And God called him back and said, I want you to write again. So he dictated the law to Moses and he wrote it on the tablet. But the Bible tells us now that was temporary, was a shadow of what was to come. Jesus said now, there is a new commandment. Even before Jesus, God has said, now in the last days I'm going to cause a new covenant. I'm going to create a new covenant, isn't it? That old covenant that people were reading on a tablet is going not to be anymore. But the new covenant, I'm now going to take those laws and write them on the tablets of their hearts. Now they are not going to read something. But that law is going to be on the tablets of their heart. Secondly, I'm going to replace that tablet or, or th that heart of stone that they've been having in the old covenant and give them a heart of what? Of flesh. So Jesus just took down to write on that tablet, isn't it? That's why their conscience were touched. Because when he wrote these commandments on their spirits, they realized, because James tells us whoever breaks any tiny bit of this law has, is guilty of all. And none of them, though they were accusing the woman of adultery, they were of themselves guilty. 
Now, look at the new teaching, Matthew chapter 7. Let's read now the last verse here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 to 6. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. It says, Now, when you read those passages of Scripture, how do you get the tone? Does the tone speak about somebody else you know? Is it speaking into, onto somebody else? Because mo most of these very uh, not-so-good Scriptures usually speak to our neighbors more than ourselves, isn't it? The tone of that verse, when you find the tone of that verse and the spirit of that verse, it ap applies more to your, a friend of yours, you know, isn't it? Or a colleague, but not to you. Because, no, far be it from you that somebody will call you a hypocrite. How? You hypocrite. He's saying, oh, that's my neighbor. That's my colleague at work. That's hypocrite. But he's saying here that remove first what is in your eye. And then, but if you read this verse, it's going to show you that it is impossible to remove what is in your eye completely. Because there is always something that will be in your eye. In other words, what he's telling us is that forever you will not be a judge. Yeah? Because you have been granted mercy, you are going to show mercy. One thing that this teaching uh, brings to us is that no matter you are shame where you are from, and however public that shame has been made, God is turning that around for his glory. Most of us have some shame somewhere. It is very impossible to live with in this life without some shame. Some people your shame might be where you come from, or your parents, or your children, hmm? or your job, or your marriage. Is that making sense? That is why most of us do not attend these these uh, reunions, these reunions, you know, your high schools are meeting, the people you are with in high school or primary, you don't go. Because usually people are testifying of good things. Somebody's driving, somebody has a job, somebody has a wife with the nice children, you know, and you're not married. So you're wondering what you're going to tell them. Yeah? Not that you don't want to go. If you went to a university, they have some reunions, isn't it? But do you go? No, you don't go. At least not before you are okay. You know, most people only attend. <laughs> they ask, where have you been? No, I think I've not, I've not been getting the communication. Liar. You got the communication, but you are not yet ready. You didn't have something to show, isn't it? Because there people are just talking about, hey, my husband, my job, my company. Everybody's coming in, driving. How can you walk to that place? So you don't go. Hmm? <laughs> or your family day, people are coming. Cousins are there from Germany, from wherever, from U.S., from South Africa. And your cousins are coming with their children, and they have grandchildren, and people are employed, they have businesses. And you see, your children is a prayer item, isn't it? So you don't... <laughs> you keep them away from home. No, because you don't want to, but it's just a place of shame. And people are saying maybe we have a reunion for our parents you, so, and people are inviting their parents. Ah, that's not the kind of parent you want to show up because you are not even so sure what he's going to say. Isn't it? You know those kind of parents that you, you are, <laughs> they have taught you intercessory. When they are, they are standing up, you are just interceding, Father God, by fire. 
by that. <laughs> But the people who are accusing you sometimes, there are people who don't even care how you're feeling. They don't care what you're going through. You see, before they have even accused you, they don't even know the story. Because they didn't have time to sit down and ask this woman about the story. The fact that you've seen a single woman does not mean she is not able to keep her husband. There's just some story you don't know about. Huh? Other, oh, she's 40. She's not married. Why? She does not know how to look good and, you know, say the right words. She might know the right words better than you, by the way. Hmm? Know that you are better or you did something. Because we are in a religion where people believe that you must do something for you to get something. And you can be Christian and thinking, oh, I prayed for one week, then God came through. It's not about your prayer. <laughs> Let me tell you, when it rained yesterday, did you pray about it? There are things that just happen because of his goodness. It's called God's benevolence, isn't it? Blesses you even when you don't think about it. It's not what you did. Uh -uh. But the accusers usually do not know so much about you. So they just say. But the most devastating thing is that sometimes we get that environment in church. It's supposed to be out there. But sometimes we get it in church. Because a church is supposed to be a refuge, a place where people run to, isn't it? But you know sometimes a church can be a place where you run from. Because the, the church folk are more harsh than the people in the world. Yeah? She got pregnant. She got a baby. Eh? People have never thought just to sit down and think, my goodness, for nine months you carried that baby? You did wrong. But I applaud the fact that you didn't just flush out the baby. You sat down and said, I'm going to take it. Isn't it? She didn't do the correct thing. You must rebuke that sin, but accept the person. Because it doesn't mean that those who are sitting with pretty faces are the good ones. No. There are people who are standing before corpses. Three, four of them. But their face is well made. Eh? Their nails are well made. It's not that they are angels. No, the one that you see as a great demon might be the angel among them. Come on, am I speaking to someone? I say this because I work among young people. But the most innocent ones are the dangerous ones. Because they, they are just looking innocent because maybe they have knowledge about birth control. They know how to take care of themselves. It only caught the innocent one. <laughs> Because even the innocent one didn't know those things. She just tried for one day. She didn't know that it works that way. But then she came. Then you're saying, my goodness, this is just terrible. You are a sinner. Oh, oh, she's not a sinner. Look around you. The people that are, are, <laughs> are busy around you, those are the problem. Hmm? Jesus did not overlook the sin. I, don't, I want to be clear. He, she, he, didn't over, he didn't say you did well. Don't care about them. Because we have those friends again. Who says, go, don't care about them. Don't listen to what they are saying. No, go, you have done a, a sin. What you have done is a problem, isn't it? Yes, do not do this again. But I have a place of mercy. Because I received mercy, I am going to give mercy. Did you know that it's easier to give mercy to strangers than the people you know? Eh? If you had somewhere at your workplace, a colleague came to you and shared something and says, girl, I don't know what to do. My, my, my only daughter is pregnant. What would you do? Oh, God will come through for you. Can I come and visit? Then you go and visit the girl. You say, don't worry. You shall make it. I've seen people who have made it. Nini, nini. That is a neighbor's friend. Until it comes to your house. <laughs> you say, what will people think about me? Do you know my place in society? Do you? And she's asking, what is your place? <laughs> but they go, what is your place? <laughs> God shall exchange your shame for beauty. That is why when you read scripture, God always took the children of Israel, every place of their shame, he took them back. 
When God had blessed them and enriched them and caused them to be a great nation, he called the people who had ashamed them to show him his mercy and grace. The Bible says, Ephesians 3.10, it says, Unto principalities and powers that they may know the manifold wisdom of God by the church. That those principalities and powers may know how God is wise and powerful by using you and me. Eh? That God has called you and put you in a special place. That through your shame, come on, saying, do you know that the place of your greatest shame is the place of your ministry? Eh? How, <laughs> let me share with you this. I was working in the bank, just, an, just a banker going every day in the job and doing my best because I knew I had a ministry, but I didn't know how big. Eh? I didn't know. Who made me know that? The devil. Because if, do you know, if you are small, you, the government cannot bring bulldozers to, to, to dig a trench. Can they? Yeah? Ukiona bulldozers zimesimama maali. Unajuliza nini? There's something major. China Wuyi somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> In this <laughs> Uh, so, so one day the de department I was supervising just was about to lose some money. They withdrew the, the guys who was, by the way, the guy who was trying to, to, to steal this money was in a wheelchair. So he, he was a guy that just comes to the banking hall, the manager calls, you come, come. Because, the, you know, we, we tried to help the, but inside him he was evil. He was crippled on the outside. Inside, he was intact. <laughs> Very intact. <laughs> so one day, a report to work, I said, Francis, report to the investigative team. I said, what is the problem? Said, so, some money was being withdrawn, a total of 240 million. But they managed to withdraw 2 million, and then we, we blocked the accounts and so on. And because you're in charge of that, you and the rest, the team there. But I knew that even the people that were with, eventually, of course, uh, that night we slept in the... Um, I told you I'd slept many times in the, in, the, in the police cells, isn't it? Yeah, if you need experiences, <laughs> you can come and ask. <laughs> I have slept several times in the police cells. So, but this was a different time. So we went, uh, and we were there. The following day, they said that we took, we take you to court. So we went to court. But I knew that these people, you know, I didn't even know what they were talking about. But well, we went, and they had. Why I knew the devil was after me is because. When they reported the case, they said Francis Omedo and others. <laughs> mm. Well, we went, we read the plea, are you guilty, not guilty, wherever, wherever, and we were taken back. When we went back, in the evening that day, because we, we posted bond and we went out, um, so in the evening, of course, when I looked at the news, KTN, and KBC, and then in TV at that time, I was there standing like this. <laughs> Bankers defraud the bank of 240 million. Then the following day, of course, people were just calling me, hey, have you seen this? Then I went, because I never buy papers, but that day I bought, uh, the following day I bought, my face was there on on, news, on the Daily Nation and Standard, just standing. <sighs> but anyway, so we fought with the bank anyway for eight years until last year. Last year in March, that's when we, we were set free, by the way. <laughs> so then I started asking myself, why would the devil come to me like this? I mean, I'm just a little Kenyan in this, doing my business. Then I realized 
there is something. At that time, the devil thought he was going to ashamed me. Because people were calling me from my life all over the place. They were calling my friends. I remember one lady we went to, high, uh, to college with was telling me the other day, my friends called because they, we were in the same class, so they knew my circle of friends. They were calling. He says, so, so and so, wamekugawi angapi? Hmm? Out of the 240 million, so he thought my friends are very rich because I said, where she got 10 million, where she got 20 million. So then I thought about my, and with the time through going through that case, I've realized Kumbe can handle 240 million. Kumbe, my influence is not local, it's national. Because the devil would not put me on paper if I didn't have that impact. But God turns around your shame. But, and the good thing is that I knew the people were talking about it. Because when we met, and I went to every meeting, like our reunion, Egerton University, we shall go there every semester. I went and preached. Of course, at that time, the organizers, when we were going through that, they didn't believe. So you could not even have some time to, to testify. Because they didn't want, that face was killing the image of the, of the team. <laughs> but I knew them, each and every one of them, of course, when they meet, praise God, I knew, yeah? Praise God, my brother, how are you doing? <laughs> Rise up on your feet. My time is up. But God is changing your testimony too. And after you have received mercy, give mercy. After you have received mercy, give. Wow. Do not let your shame bring you down. Because in those years I knew some days, some Sundays I was standing here to preach, but I knew Monday I'm in court. And when I arrive there, there's a warrant of arrest given. Hmm? But I sing in church, I say, praise God, people. God is good, hallelujah. And maybe a, a member is standing and saying, by the way, our pastor, we live, we don't pass through. We don't pass through, we don't pass through. All of us are human, you understand? It doesn't mean when you stand up, uh, up here, you are different. Niki kuchukua ni kueke hapa. Your school fees, but you don't balance. Kama uko nayo. Exactly. <laughs> uh, come on, just close your eyes for a minute. I don't know what shame you've gone through. Ah, but God is able. He says, neither do I condemn you. But God empowers you to live this life. Hmm? Don't look down upon the shame that you've gone through. No, God is going to use that for his glory. Hallelujah. Come on, speak to him now. Speak to him. Lord, say, whatever I've gone through, whatever you have allowed me to pass through, God, if it is my children that are bringing shame on my parents or my job or my business, oh Lord, you are able to silence the mouth of the accusers. The ministry team can help us. If there's somebody who wants to agree with you, a ministry team. Hallelujah. The Bible says, if you shall agree on earth as touching anything, maybe you want to agree with someone here concerning your life and say, God, give me a turn around. Give me a turn around. In the place of shame, give me beauty. In the place of shame, give me beauty. And if you're coming, come very fast because we don't have much time. Don't wait and look around for others who are coming. Just walk. And if you're here, you are not saved. This is your time. Come. 
come forward. This is your day to turn that shame. If you are here and you are not saved, don't go back. Don't leave this sanctuary. Come and pray with someone. There are people before us at the balcony. There are others. Come and pray for somebody. Tell somebody I want to be saved. Agree with me. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you've gone through shame, through some ailment, disease in your body, your business, your job, some condition that you have and people know, laugh about it, they talk about it. God is coming through for you. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There are people at the balcony, they can pray with you. If you're here, you are not saved. Come, come. Come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus will not condemn you like others have, but he'll give you life and life eternal. Hallelujah. Let me ask Peter to help us here. Peter, please. There are others waiting. Receive a restoration this morning. Receive deliverance this morning. Receive deliverance. Receive restoration. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. I speak a turn around. I speak a turn around right now. I speak a turn around. I speak a turn around. I speak a turn around now. I speak a turn around. Is happening, is happening in your life right now in the name of Jesus. The Lord who wipes our tears. Maybe you've been shamed before your spouse, you've been shamed before your family, before your friends. God is turning around, giving you a new lease of life. The place of shame shall be exchanged with beauty. And keep coming, keep coming. If you are not saved, you came to this service, you have not given your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Come, come and pray with somebody at the balcony. If you are not saved, walk to the person in front of you at the balcony and pray with someone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Father, we thank you for your gift. We thank you for your blessing. This morning we exchange our shame for your beauty. This morning we receive a restoration to glory. And this morning we ask that in the place of shame, you shall give us your beauty. Take us to the place of our shame and exalt yourself. Everywhere we've been afraid to go because of our shame, the people we have been afraid to interact with because of our shame, the things we've been afraid to do because of our shame, you are taking us to the same place because you are changing our shame and putting a new song in our spirits. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There are people here that have gone through the shame because of their children. Right now, God is speaking peace to your spirit. Every parent that have cried because of their children, this morning you receive your restoration. That child shall bring you glory. The one that was rejected, the one they didn't talk, want to talk about, the one you didn't even consider. Oh, come on. Somebody has a witness right now. I know there's a witness in your spirit. There's a witness in your spirit. Right now, receive it right now. Receive it right now. Receive it right now in the name of Jesus. In a short while, God is doing something. Changing, transforming. That your pride and your glory will come out of your shame. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I commit everyone in this service to you. Thank you because they have come to your place of worship. Speak to their spirits. Energize their hearts. Lift their heads. Anoint their countenance. That this week they shall walk as children of God. Whatever they are going through, O oh God, and whatever they face in their lives, let your Holy Spirit be close to them. Let them hear your voice saying you can make it because of your power and your grace in jesus name we pray amen give god a shout